Hello and welcome to GameSat. Some games don't get the love or even the attention that they deserve. So I'm here to talk about some games that I feel are, well, criminally overlooked. That's right, criminally. I mean, you don't want to go to jail for overlooking these games, do you? I didn't think so. First up is a game that I've been enjoying since pretty much about when the Genesis launched, a little after. Mystic Defender is an early game for the Genesis, released by Sega themselves in 1989. It's a pure action platformer that's actually a lot of fun. In fact, I pull this one down from the shelf and play it quite often. It's the sequel to a Master System game called Spellcaster, though all of the names in the game have been changed. Spellcaster has similar action sequences, but it notably also had some adventure aspects to it as well. Both games are based on the Kajaku Ou Magna series in Japan, and this one is properly called Kajaku Ou 2 over there. I think it would have been cool if this had been called Spellcaster 2 in the West, but I guess I'm fine with Mystic Defender. The adventure stuff has all been removed for the Genesis game, which may disappoint some people, but I never felt that aspect was very well done in the original game. The story is basically that the evil people have kidnapped your girl and you're off to the rescue. For such an early game, the action is pretty well done. First off, the control is very solid and responsive. If your character gets hit or dies, it's 100% your fault. The game itself isn't overly difficult, but the continues are limited and you only get three lives unless you choose an easier difficulty. Magic is your main weapon and you start out by shooting little magic balls. If you hold down the attack button, you can charge your magic for a more powerful attack. As you advance in the game, you gain different types of magic and you can switch through them on the fly with the A button. Your other main magics are the fire, as well as the bouncy balls which bounce all over the screen for a bit. The fire magic is my favorite because it burns for a while and you can even change its direction. It's really fun to use. In addition, there's a lightning bolt magic that you can sometimes grab. You can only use this once each time you grab it and it summons some dragons to damage everything on the screen. There are colored orbs that you can collect as well. The blue ones will restore a chunk of your life bar. The red ones will let you charge your magic much faster. At its basic level, your magic charge is very slow and you're vulnerable while you wait. Grabbing a few red orbs substantially speeds this up, so you really want these. If you die, you respawn at the same place and keep your magic, but your charge speed resets. Continuing will put you back at the beginning of the stage. There's some precise platforming to do here, and seriously, it's pretty damn fun. Graphically, it's not bad for its time, though it seems pretty sparse compared to later games on the console. It's only 4 mega power, so there's not a lot of room to spare here. As a result, you'll see a few reused and recolored assets during your mystical journey. But there is some nice parallax here and there for you to appreciate. Audio-wise, it's, again, decent for its time. The music certainly isn't bad, but it's nothing you're going to want to jam to with the volume cranked up to 11. The charging and fire-burning sound effects are a little grating, but that's as bad as this game gets. The first revision of this game features a fully naked final boss. This guy isn't the final boss, by the way. But she's covered in later revisions. Don't get too excited, though, because you're not really missing much. Seriously, though, give this game a try. It was overlooked in its time, and even today, people rarely say anything about it. Just because the presentation is kind of average doesn't mean it isn't fun. This is the Twisted Tales of Spike McFang from Naxat and Red and published by Bulletproof Software. It was released in 1994. You'd think that you'd control an anthropomorphic wolf-like character in this one, but no. Instead, you're a human who wears a top hat, which of course means you're a magician who specializes in card tricks. Your islands are under attack, and of course you have to save the day, since you're the protagonist of the game and all. This one's an action RPG, and no, it's not related to Trevor McFur on the Atari Jaguar, thank god. Your main attack is spinning with your cape. As you can imagine, the range is pretty short, but generally it's effective. Just try not to hammer on the attack button too much. If you do, you'll briefly have a wider attack range, but you'll get dizzy and be vulnerable for a few seconds afterwards. You can also toss your top hat by holding down the attack button. I feel that this could work a bit better, but it's still effective for getting enemies that you in no way, shape, or form want to get close to. You can buy other hats which have a more effective flight pattern as well. You also carry cards which can do different things. 
like have a flaming attack, or attack the enemies with a bunch of bats, or even refill your life. Speaking of your life, your life bar is represented with tomatoes for some reason. Not only that, but every enemy in the game has a life bar which is nice. Unlike Zelda, you can level up in this game. In fact, every time you reach a new level, you get a call on your cellular telephone informing you. This game is pretty tough, so I recommend that you grind as much as you can. And then after you think you've grinded enough, grind one more level. Unfortunately, the grinding can take a while. The traps and enemies will drain your life quickly. The items that the enemies drop don't replenish much life or even give you a lot of money, and you'll want to buy some tomato cards and maybe a better hat to help with some of the boss fights. You also get different companions throughout your adventure who will fight alongside you. They're marginally effective, but they can be powered up by using certain cards. Graphically, the game is nice if a bit simple, but the colors are good. It's all very cartoony looking. I like how the sprites aren't simply flipped when facing the opposite direction, but redrawn instead. The sound is fine, though the music is a bit whimsical which may get on your nerves after it loops a few dozen times. Some tunes are more Super Nintendo-like, however, with the weepy strings and whatnot that the RPGs on the console are mostly known for. I don't think that I've ever heard anyone talk or write about this game, and it's a good little action RPG for the system. You should definitely give it a go if you like these kinds of games, and if you don't mind the grinding that sometimes gets in the way. I certainly don't. Sometimes games just don't get a very wide distribution in the arcade, so the home ports don't have any name recognition to capitalize on. In fact, I don't think that this one was advertised much, if at all, in the gaming media of the time once it finally did come home. Anyway, let's check it out. Here's Midnight Resistance on the Genesis from Data East. This one is a side-scrolling run-and-gun and also a port of the arcade game of the same name. It's actually a sequel to Data East's overhead run-and-gun game called Heavy Barrel. This game plays in a similar fashion, though it's been a bit simplified. You still mow down the enemies and the red ones still drop keys for you to collect. But here, you're not trying to build the ultimate weapon, instead you use the collected keys to unlock more weapons and special items between the stages. I usually go for the three-way weapon. I mean, who doesn't like a good three-way? I spend most of my other keys on ammunition as only your basic pea shooter has unlimited ammo. You can also get some special weapons which will drop some punishment if you press up or a barrier and the like. However, I don't usually feel that I need them. There's also this sparkly thing. This will make the weapon that you currently have more powerful. It goes away when you die, which happens when you pretty much touch anything other than the ground. However, you can still pick up your weapon and the keys that you've collected. You can't switch between weapons, and you're stuck with what you've got until it runs out of ammo or you get a different one in between stages. In the arcade, the game featured rotating joysticks just like Heavy Barrel so you could aim and move at the same time. I've gotta be honest, I like the control in the Genesis version a lot more. Like, tons more. It's a bit weird, and it'll take a few minutes to acclimate to, but once you do, it's pretty nice. With the default control scheme, button A turns on and off your weapon fire. You don't need to hold down any buttons to actually fire. Button B will lock your weapon into its current direction so you can move around without changing your aim. Letting go of B lets you re-aim as you move. And of course, the C button jumps. Visually, it's not as nice as the arcade and honestly not even pretty for a Genesis game. Most Data East games developed by Opera House on the Genesis look pretty chunky and this one is no exception. They love using the Genesis's lower 256 pixel wide mode which makes the pixels a bit fatter. The graphics are often pretty dark and muddy in this one as well. It's also nowhere near being optimized. The game only runs at 30 frames per second, and there's lots of slowdown and a ton of flicker. It does have a few pretty good looking moments though, like when you climb up here for this boss fight. Still, with all the slowdown and flicker problems, it's no surprise that this game is only for a single player. But honestly, that's fine. I don't have any friends, and I know you don't. Sound-wise, however, this game exceeds expectations. It has the same music as the arcade version, but it sounds way better on the Genesis thanks to Hitoshi Sakimoto's sound driver.
music is pumping and it always makes me excited. I mean, who needs Viagra when you got- No, I'm not going there. I just wish that there were more music tracks than there are. As to the elephant in the room, yeah, this game is kind of a dollar store contra. Still though, it's a really fun dollar store contra. It's certainly easier on the default difficulty, though you can get screwed if you die in the last stage as you won't be able to get any good weapons if you continue. Don't let the weird controls, murky graphics, and the slow frame rate turn you off. Give this one a try, or three. This is Shadow of the Ninja on the NES from Natsume. The title of this game is very familiar to me and I saw it advertised in a ton of magazines back in the day, but I never really sat down and played it. And I haven't really seen anyone else talk about it or play it either. You know what? It's a pretty good game. Usually when you think of ninja games in the 8-bit era, you think of Ninja Gaiden or Shinobi. While I don't feel that this game is in any way unknown, I do feel that it's not on a lot of people's minds. That could be because of the difficulty which I'll talk about in a bit. As with most video games, the story is a literary masterpiece. It takes place in 2029, and apparently the Twin Towers have been rebuilt. We also now have an emperor for some reason known as Garuda, and some lives have been lost. Two ninjas set out to defeat the emperor. And that's it. That's the story. Hell, I'd rather have a weak story attached to a good game than a game itself desperately trying to be a movie, as so often happens with high-budget modern games. Anyway, the ninjas are called shadows for whatever reason, though you can clearly see them in full detail. You can choose which ninja you want to play as at the start, but it doesn't matter as far as moves, strength, or abilities go. Your default weapon is a sword which has a short range. You can open boxes to get new weapons like an extended sword, a limited amount of ninja throwing stars, or Xari Gama, which is a weapon you may remember from Ninja Spirit on a celebrated TurboGrafx-16 console from NEC. There's also a little bomb-like weapon that you can get further into the game, which has a limited amount similar to the throwing stars. These boxes can occasionally have life refills if you're extremely lucky. The control is well done, and you can grapple to things above you, and you can press up to flip up to stand on the thing you were hanging on. You cannot hang from ceilings or other structures that you can't flip to the other side on. Like I said earlier, this game is tough. This is mainly due to the common enemies needing quite a few hits before they die. If that's not enough, there are several places where they come at you from different directions at the same time, meaning you're gonna take a hit, or two, or three. The game can also be a bit cheap in some places and not give you much, if any, time to react, even if you know what's coming. Interestingly, I feel that the boss encounters are mostly perfectly balanced. They're not easy, but they're learnable, and most importantly, they're fun. The boss battles are definitely the highlight of the game for me. You can also play two players simultaneously, which I haven't had the chance to do, but I imagine that would make things a bit easier since the common enemies would have something else to aim at. There's not a ton of two-player simultaneous action games on the NES, so if you're one of those people who are normal and have friends, this is one you should try with them. Visually, the game is pretty nice. There's no parallax scrolling or anything like that, but there's quite a bit of detail, even if some of the areas seem a bit monochromatic. The sound and music are both pretty typical for the system. It's not bad in any way, and I can even remember the music when I'm not playing, it's just not something that special or even stands out much. It kind of reminds me of some of the chip tunes used in modern games that go for that NES feel. Give this one a try if you haven't. It puts up a good challenge and you'll always want to give it another go once your last continue is used up. You're not in the clear yet. I still have a couple of more games to show you before you can beat this criminal rap. Now this next game is hardly unknown, but it's in a series where it often gets overshadowed by the other games that are in it. And that just fills me with rage! Ridge Racer from Namco is a great series that became well known on the exciting PlayStation console from Sony. And for good reason, it's a fun racing game. 
But the one that hardly anyone ever mentions is Rage Racer, which is the third game in the series on the console. I picked this one up because it wasn't just a prettied up rehash like Ridge Racer Revolution was. I'm sure glad I did because I ended up playing this one for dozens of hours back in the day. The gameplay is similar to the previous two entries in the series as far as handling of the cars is concerned. Like those two, I prefer to play this one from the hood camera instead of the external camera as I feel the external one just controls really weird honestly. They'd end up fixing this in the next game. The drift mechanics also seem similar, and I was never able to get a good grasp on the drifting in these first few games, so I tend not to do it. I mean, it's certainly no outrun 2 when it comes to drifting. The good news is that you can still win without drifting, but as your vehicles get faster and faster, you might want to try to master it to get around the tighter corners. Be careful though, because a bad drift can set you further back than if you had not attempted it at all. What's new here is that this is the first Ridge Racer game that has loading screens. That means the tracks are much bigger, and the entire game can't fit into the PlayStation's RAM like the previous two did. As a result, this is a much more fleshed out and full experience. You earn money and you can buy new cars, and they all perform and feel very different. If you need an edge and are happy with your current car, you can also pay to tune it up and make it better. Just be careful not to lose races as you only have so many chances. Of course, if you back out of the Grand Prix and save after you win each race, then you can always just reload if you happen to lose one. The cars and tune-ups can be a little expensive sometimes, so you may end up grinding a bit on races you've already won in order to earn some more money. This may turn some people off, and yeah, it can be a bit annoying, but usually grinding is something that doesn't bother me much, just as long as I feel like I'm making progress. Unfortunately, there's not a ton of different tracks to race on here. Like the previous two titles, the entire game takes place in a single area with the track branching off in different directions. It wouldn't be until the next game where the series would finally break this formula at least more so than this. Graphically, the game is fine, if a bit dark and grainy. There's not a ton of color here, and most things are very, very gray. You do race at different times of the day, so at least there's a touch of variety. Sometimes the time even changes as you race. You can design your own team logo or emblem, and back when this game was new, I thought this was awesome. Hell, I still love it today. It allows you to add a bit of your own flair to the game to make it feel a bit more personal. I mean, I just love seeing my logo on my car. The music is typical of the series, meaning that it's got funky electronic tunes that are great to listen to as you race. The announcer lady is a bit muffled though, but that's not really a big deal. The sound the tires make when you drift is bad enough to make you never ever want to drift. Yuck. Overall, I feel that this is the best Ridge Racer game out of the first three. It's not perfect, but it absolutely deserves to be played and enjoyed. When it comes to Sega CD Laserdisc-based FMV games, Road Avenger from Renovation and Wolf Team gets all of the attention. And rightfully so, as it's an extremely fun and zany adventure in so many ways. But another Laserdisc arcade game converted to the Sega CD from Wolf Team is Cobra Command. This was a launch title for the add-on, and it's better than most of you probably think. This one is also known as Thunderstorm in some regions. There's a ruthless terrorist organization that's determined to rule the world, so the good guys send out a single helicopter to combat this menace despite our insanely high military budget. It's up to you to fight for freedom wherever there's trouble. And that's good because they are absolutely everywhere, mainly in super popular places like New York, the Grand Canyon, Rome, or the middle of the desert. You'll be fighting for freedom over land and air. You even get to fight a battle on Easter Island as they've naturally built a base there. The gameplay is easy to grasp. You have a button to fire your Vulcan and also a button to fire your missiles, and you can hold them down for rapid fire, but they overheat quickly. However, if you just casually tap on the buttons, this won't happen and you'll be okay. So now you know, and knowing is half the battle. You need to be firing on a target once the targeting indicator appears for the enemy to be destroyed. If you miss, they get you and you lose a life. Oh no, say goodbye to freedom. You can't let that happen, so you've got to try again. Occasionally, you'll need to hold a direction for a couple of seconds in order to clear an obstacle or simply not crash. 
Fortunately, you never need to press a direction and fire at the same time, and usually there's at least a half a second of recovery time after moving before you need to have your reticle over an enemy. The game can get quite tough in the upper stages, and there are only two continues, but with perseverance, you'll be able to beat this one after some practice. The graphics were pretty awesome for their time on a home video game console, although it lost most of its animation frames and color on the way home. It can sometimes be hard to make out what things are, but you'll get over it. Like Road Avenger, Wolf Team also redid all of the audio on this release, and it's much more engaging and intense compared with how limp the arcade version sounds. If you have a good stereo system, you'll want to crank this one up for sure, as it really makes the experience more exciting. Here they come! Aircraft carrier ahead! This game is also available on the Saturn and PlayStation in Japan, along with Road Avenger, aka Road Blasters. It certainly looks a lot better, but for some reason it doesn't seem to play quite as smoothly. You have to be much more accurate and hit the center of the targeting indicator. Also, the sound in any version not on the Sega or Mega CD has the original mono arcade sound, which is kind of boring. Still, this is a fun one on any platform. It's certainly not as wacky as Road Avenger can be, and it doesn't have a cheesy song, but it's still lots of fun and definitely one of the better Laserdisc based video games on the market. Don't shortchange this one. Give it a try, and you'll be fighting to save the day. There you go, those are some more criminally overlooked games. But since you appreciated them here with me, I don't think it's gonna be a stain on your record. I mean, you did appreciate them, right? Anyway, what are some more games that you feel are criminally overlooked? Let me know and I'm gonna send a law to check them out. Okay, this whole shtick is getting kind of tiresome. But anyway, in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack.